everybody. Welcome to our Discovering Architecture Middle Class podcast. And what Asanka and I want to do is to talk about architecture, software architecture, in a pragmatic and interesting way so people can use uh, better approaches for building systems and learn to improve architecture and design architectures that will scale and solve the problem at hand in the, in the most efficient and time-effective manner. Uh, my name is Sanjeev. I'm the founder and CEO of WC2. I have a background in computer science. I have a PhD in computer science in 1994 from Purdue. I've been involved with uh, building various systems for many years. I run uh, product management, product strategy for WC2 uh, as well as uh, being the CEO of the company. And I'm also the creator of the Ballina programming language, which attempts to bring new and clear architectural paradigms to the programming language itself. And Asanka. Uh, great. Uh, so I'm Asanka Basinger. Uh, I'm the CTO at WSO2. Uh, been in the industry for more than 20 years and been with WSO2 more than 15 years, almost from the beginning. Uh, so I'm coming from an application architecture and application development background, and I have helped many organizations in different uh, business domains to build large uh, distributed systems. Uh, I started my career as a COBOL programmer, and then uh, with the technology changes, uh, step into different type of other technologies as well. Uh, so, uh, in a Saturday, uh, Sanjeeva came up with this idea and texted me by telling, hey, we should do a, a video cast. I was really interested because both of us were participating for different uh, podcasts hosted by various individuals. But we thought we should have our own platform to share our uh, thoughts as well. All right. Uh, so, without further ado, let's get started on our journey. This is the first episode, so I'm sure it's going to be a bit glitchy and problematical while we figure out how to manage this conversation. But we're going to start off with a bit of an abstract conversation instead of about a specific architectural problem or paradigm or technology or approach, but really talk about a broader problem that you're trying to solve with software architecture. In the end, people, architecture is a tool. It's a tool that helps you guide how you build systems and how you build software systems, not, not just build them, but build them so that they can be delivered on time, within budget, and at the right level of quality. And uh, at least in my own experience, I don't think we ever do all three at the same time. Within budget, on time, and at the quality. You always end up trading something else off. So if you step back and ask, why is that? Why are we not able to build software at the right level of quality, within budget, and on time? The fundamental problem lies in the abstractions that you use to think about the software. So in this episode, we want to talk briefly about abstractions and what they are and what the problem that we're trying to solve by saying, hey, if we get the right abstractions, then we can think about it uh, properly. So before we get into sort of some examples, some real world examples of these quality abstractions, let me spend a little bit more time explaining what we're trying to do, what, what these abstractions mean. So abstraction is, of course, uh, a way of hiding all the ugly details from your vision and being able to see a clear picture with, with just a wireframe or high-level structure and abstraction of the reality on the ground. And the goal of that is if you can think at that level and then if you can build at that level and if you can implement at that level, then those abstractions are the ones that then represent what you are implementing. So having the right abstractions are critical in order to build software systems that will actually work and work reliably and be able to be delivered on time. Right? So let's now take a little look at some examples of abstractions. Yeah, so I think uh, before getting into the uh, uh, examples from the computer science world, uh, there are two things coming to my mind when uh, we speak about abstraction. First thing is maps, that how uh, the we can find a place and how we can navigate to uh, play, uh, from one place to another place without uh, uh, getting into details and then maps will kind of abstract that uh, path for us to uh, find the shortest path as well as how quickly we can get into the uh, that particular location. The second example is more of a Gen X thing, not a Gen Z thing. Uh, so it's about the transistor radio. 
So if you look at a transistor radio, you will see few knobs that you can tune it, you can increase the volume or you can change the channel. But you, if you turn the transistor radio back, you will see a complex system. Like you will see the transistors, capacitors and all these um, equipments that you need to build the transistor. So that's where, uh, like Sanjeev explained, uh, how we can hide the complexity and uh, uh, give a simple interface for the users to use. I think there are two fundamental things coming when it comes to the, uh, the uh, software related abstractions. First thing is the hiding the complexity that we call as the encapsulation. And the second thing is the partitioning, like how you can uh, divide the problem into multiple parts. That's where these modules and operation type of concepts are coming. And that is the fundamental for the uh, uh, abstractions that we find in uh, the various things that we touch in our uh, software world. Yeah, so let me let me take a couple of, uh, let's start off with going through a couple of software side abstractions. So Sankar touched upon modularity and partitioning and sort of organizing, uh, organizing your thinking. So one of the fundamental things that uh, were a key abstraction in computer science is the concept of an abstract data type. Uh, this is something you learn when you study computer science. You learn about abstract data types, about the idea of information hiding, about giving managed exposure of information and so on. And this is something invented by a person named Barbara Discoff. She was a professor at MIT and she got a Turing Award for it. And what that did was come up with a theory about thinking about complex data in an abstract way using this concept of abstract data type. So it packaged the data beyond just bits and bytes and uh, physical infrastructure and, and basic types like integers and so forth into a concept and then say, that's the data that we are thinking about and operating on. Something yeah, I think that's a about. great uh, example. Yeah, uh, I, and I think the second uh, example we can take uh, is that something came after that. That's about the relational database management systems. I think that's introduced by Edgar Codd. And um, uh, that's basically about how you can simplify the storage of data as well as how you can simplify the retrieval of data. So the storage of data managed by the tables, columns, and rows, and you have this structured data set, and the retrieval of data coming from the standardized query language that you can query this data without an issue. So I think the, the uh, when I l started learning about uh, relational database management systems, the thing came to my mind was a library, like how the things are organized inside the library, how you can quickly access information inside the library. Same concept came with the relational database management systems as well for us to build applications by storing and retrieving data. Let me take a third example, um, which is Kubernetes. This is, of course, much newer than abstract data types and the relational data management architecture, both of which got Turing Awards. Kubernetes hasn't gone got yet, gotten one yet, but I'm sure it will. Um, Kubernetes, basically, what Kubernetes did was said, well, we can create an abstraction for computing, for running pieces of code that allows us to think about the underlying hardware that, that obviously exists somewhere in a very clear and simple way. So in the Kubernetes architecture, there is a concept of worker node, which is a physical device, where a physical or virtual machine in which you're actually running the Kubernetes infrastructure component. And there are some other layers below that. But the application level who writes a piece of code and runs something on a Kubernetes cluster, thinks in terms of a container, a Docker container right now, that gets mapped into a concept of a pod, which is a collection of containers that, that operate as a whole. And then you can replicate that and build deployments on that. And so these simple abstractions that Kubernetes has come up with allows us to essentially forget about where is my server, which server is it on, where is it physically located, and have a much, much simpler architecture for thinking about software that now again touches on, on the aspect of granularity because a piece of software running in Kubernetes is meant to be a small piece of software because you're running these small things and if I want to do more, I run many of those. So it's just replicas that you create of the pods that you're running and being able to manage them in a simple way is what Kubernetes does really, really well. And this naturally leads to how do you build systems that 
scale properly and can be managed properly because now you have an abstraction at the lowest level which says well you don't need to think about virtual machines and IP addresses and so forth. Kubernetes says the network is programmable. All the logical infrastructure of, of the system that you're running is programmable and you build on top of that. Yeah, I think we spoke about like the foundational uh, set of abstractions and then some abstractions into the deployment side. I think we better jump into the business level abstractions because that's uh, important. End of the day, we are creating applications to provide some experience for end users. So when it comes to the business level abstractions, we can find uh, a couple of things, but we will uh, take a few important factors there. First thing is about APIs. APIs are uh, the uh, really uh, great abstractions for a business to wrap the business capabilities and then provide it through an API. So that's how the internal developers, external developers and their partners can uh, consume these business capabilities securely through APIs and build various applications and provide it to the end users. And when it comes to the APIs, APIs uh, might need uh, logic as well. That's where the services are coming, that you can write this uh, different type of business logic inside the services and let them uh, expose through an API. So that's one way of doing it. But then again, uh, today's systems need uh, like real time information uh, as well as more asynchronous uh, communication as well. And events are really important when it comes to uh, that type of a communication. Again, events are abstracting that complexity uh, because as a consumer, you will see set of topics and you can uh, filter the messages as well as you can subscribe into the interesting topics that you need to consume inside your application and build uh, these type of applications. Then the uh, next thing is about the data. Uh, so we spoke about the relational database uh, management systems, but uh, there are various other ways to manage data as well. Uh, so when it comes to a business, data is really important and simplifying how you access the data and then uh, you store the data is key. That's where I think uh, the concepts like data as a product and then uh, you see these other concepts like uh, data measures coming into the picture. All these uh, technologies, what it does basically um, simplifying that uh, retrieval and storage of data uh, into application development. So what you talked about Asanka, sort of the, the abstractions that you need in order to design applications and yes. deploy them and, and operate them in an enterprise architecture. Let me talk a little bit about now, great, you wrote some code, now how do I get it into production? How do I manage it at runtime? What is the overall architecture that I'm deploying into? And of course, again, the software manufacturing process has become a lot more robust in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, years ago, it used to be that uh, the software was free, the hardware was not, now kind of reversed. Now, the hardware is basically free, the software is very expensive. And uh, so because of that, we've really developed very strong protocols. So we, of course, have CI, CD, which, which worries about building the software in an automated way so that whenever there are changes, it builds a newest version of the software, or along with all the dependencies, then the deployment. And so the CD part is continuous deployment. Then we have GitOps, we have DevOps, we have SecOps. We have various things that are there in order to make that development process into something that you can automate and have a systematic approach instead of saying, well, you know, I am building it on some random place and I have to have a clean environment. All of that is fully mechanized into a systematic structure that just says, hey, you write the code and then there's an automation that takes place to get it into a operating environment, whether it is a dev environment or a staging or a production environment. And that, again, builds on the underlying abstractions of the programming language once and of the, of the API services, events, and data and says, okay, now I can get it up and running in an environment. Yeah. So I think uh, when you are speaking about uh, architecture level abstractions, uh, we can't forget about something that we introduced around 2018 
time frame called cell-based architecture. And we touch based on the partitioning and separation of concerns at the beginning as well. So uh, the whole purpose of the cell-based architecture also linked to that, that how you can um, have these uh, individual cells that we call in the cell-based architecture to organize your components. And component can be a, a, a API, it can be a service um, or something that produces the events. So those things can be well organized inside these cells and then have a, a proper way to develop it and uh, uh, deploy it as well. And this is helping how the organizations are structured. Uh, I think there's this uh, Conway law as well. Uh, the communication pattern uh, of the organization is affecting the, uh, uh, how you build software inside the organization. That's what the Conway law is telling. Uh, so that can uh, use to organize the cells properly and some of the concepts like uh, domain-driven design uh, can be utilized there as well. If uh, the organization is using domain-driven design, a domain or a subdomain can directly map into a cell and organize these components inside the uh, cell-based architecture. And that's a, a really good way to uh, manage these large applications, uh, design them, uh, develop them and deploy them into uh, the great abstraction layers like Kubernetes that Sanjeev explained. And of course, right along with Kubernetes in, 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 a, in any kind of large scale infrastructure today, we don't generally want to depend on one cloud infrastructure. So the concepts of multi-cloud also plays right into that because that means you need to say, okay, I want to build systems, I want to design them, I want to implement them, but I don't necessarily buy into exactly one cloud platform. And that can be simply because you want portability across clouds, which of course comes at a price, which, because that means you can't use any of the advantages of that platform. Or it can mean because you want to have a high availability, because one cloud uh, going down doesn't mean the other cloud will go down. And so if you want to guarantee availability, then that's the way of doing it. So those are kind of some of the other aspects of uh, abstraction brought into all the way to bring it into a production environment in a scalable way that you need to think about when you're building a real system that has to operate in high available mode. Yeah. And one uh, issue that we see inside some of the enterprises, uh, since uh, it's really hard to get some of these uh, business level abstractions correctly, they stick to one architecture and they treat it as a static architecture. But that's uh, not the way uh, that we should treat the architecture because uh, things are changing, right? Uh, one uh, area is the business requirements are changing and then uh, the how they are, uh, their business models are changing as well. And same time, the technology is changing rapidly. So that's where the concept of an iterative approach uh, should come because iterative development is common, but uh, iterative architecture is not that uh, common. So I think uh, there, that's another area that we should uh, look at because sometimes people might think since we got the abstractions correctly, we should stick to that, but that's not the key. We need, key. Uh, we need to uh, uh, keep an eye on the changes happening and keep on uh, changing the architecture to fit into the current requirements because end of the day, uh, the we have to generate value out of the architecture that we build and um, uh, basically the uh, the the technology side shouldn't be a cost center, it has to be a value center. So iterative architecture is a real good way to improve the abstractions as well as provide more and more value to the business. Absolutely. I, I, th I think uh, that's a very important point about iterative architecture. Uh, it's something that people often don't, don't think about because a lot of people think that, well, I'm building some systems, so I need to get the architecture right. And then I can do MVP implementation saying, I just implement this bit, get it up and running, then add the other part and so on. And, and the reality is in many systems, you don't know what the end game is. And, and also often there is no end game because once you start a software a digitalization path, there is no project. It is not an end game. You are permanent iteration from then on. So thinking that you're going to get the architecture exactly right one shot is completely foolhardy and so it's much better off thinking about this as an ongoing process where you have an architecture, you implement to that, learn from it, go to version 2 and if the if the underlying abstractions that you have used, used to, uh, that you've chosen to implement 
are correct, you can re-architect without having to re-implement everything. Right? It's like a good building, a well-designed building can go through architectural evolution without having to take it down to the foundation and start again. So that's that should yeah. be the goal of software systems as well. Exactly. I think that uh, project to product mindset, right? And how you can right. change it and then treat everything as a product is a key. Yeah, yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation and it's just a start. And uh, we are planning to discuss various uh, uh, these type of topics that we find in the application architecture as well as enterprise architecture in our future episodes. Uh, so uh, uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much for listening.